Hello and welcome to Media 7, I'm Russell Brown. This is a special show presented in association with Webstock and Internet New Zealand who've brought us two guests from the stellar lineup at this week's Webstock conference in Wellington. We'll meet them soon, but first our theme, crowds and communities. We all connect to the internet as individuals, but we live and act there in groups. In a special source, Sam Mulgrew looks at the ways we assemble. Vegetable arranging, Istanbul on the cheap and random awesome stuff. Whatever you're into, chances are plenty of other peeps are too. Being alone together has, so far, been done best by Facebook. With 845 million users per month, that's six times the population of Russia, it's no wonder it needs 60,000 servers. It's knocking on Google's, even China's back door. 57% of Facebook traffic comes from women, the ad man's dream client. But like the book, the internet's still a spring chicken. It's 21 years old, and it's still growing like crazy. Today, a third of the human race use the internet. And this year, 60 million people will join them from India alone. Now, as practicing capitalists, perhaps it's no surprise that we worship the guys behind the cables. Never doubt the magic of software. That's right, listen to Chewbacca. They bring many together as one, like Democrats and autocracies. They can tell people what they want to hear, like on this alternative to Wikipedia. Conservapedia. A search for homosexuality on the trustworthy encyclopedia will ruin your day. Needless to say, gay folks prefer Wikipedia. But the free and wondrous virtual mirror is incredibly vulnerable to lobbyists, liars and hackers. Enter geek protest. Yes, grannies can be geeks too. Anonymous, a mass of estranged hacktivists with a growing track record of disabling websites of governments and organisations they disagree with. Sam Mulgrew there. Now, in 1997, our first guest launched what he thought was a personal website. It swiftly became the web's great geek community, under the motto, News for Nerds, Stuff That Matters. The site was Slashdot, and he is Rob Melder. Uh, now, sometimes Twitter, always present, always instant, seems like magic. Our next guest is one of the magicians. He is Twitter's Director of Application Services and hacker of all things, Rafi Krikori. Yeah. Welcome to you both. Now, Rob... <laughs> You began Slashdot as a personal website, a blog before there were blogs. How and why did it so quickly become a big community? For a year before Slashdot, uh, I had been blogging on a site called Chips and Dips. Uh, and I was just writing about things that I was experiencing, you know, movie reviews or... Uh, I was very active in the, the Linux open source community uh, and spending most of my time in IRC chat rooms. Uh, and a lot of the content that was actually on Slashdot was stuff that I was just sort of organically pulling out of these chat rooms and sharing with my friends. Uh, and then there was a nice little feedback loop uh, that sort of accidentally happened. The, the scale of Slashdot um, quite quickly gave rise to the so-called Slashdot effect, mm. which has its own Wikipedia article. Mm. Basically, a single link can drive such a large crowd to a target site that the site can't cope and falls mm -hmm. over. When did you start to see that? Well, we started seeing it almost immediately. Uh, it didn't actually get that name for like a year or so. Uh, but, I mean, you know, in 1997, the stuff that Slashdot is linking is generally very obscure. Uh, these are websites that, you know, are getting 10, 15, 20 hits a day. Uh, and you know, Slashdot, uh, over the course of its first year, started being able to route you know, thousands or tens of thousands of page views within minutes. Uh, if you build a system that's only capable of you know, handling four or five, six pages uh, a second, and then suddenly a thousand show up for you in the next 60 seconds, you will fail. Uh, and that's, that's very funny uh, to me, <laughs> but not so funny <laughs> if you're the guy who has to have the beeper on the other end. And even back then, people didn't wear beepers for this because it's just this obscure little hobby thing. You don't realize anybody's reading it. You know, it's cool. Now, what amused me was in that Wikipedia article, uh, under the See Also section, there's a link to the article on distributed denial of service attacks, which are the, the key tool, some call it vandalism, of, of geek protesters like Anonymous. What do you make of the two being associated with each other? You could call it a denial of service, but it's not, there's no malice in it. We're actually, in the case of Slashdot, doing what you want to have done. You put a page on the internet, you want people to read that page. It's not my fault that 100,000 of them decided to view it and you were only ready for six. If you were opened a store, you'd be really happy if 100,000 people wanted to be in your store, but you might be a little crabby if only five fit in your store. Well, maybe it's your fault you should have built a bigger store. Uh, but most of the time, people just flat out weren't ready. 
you know, I can definitely see the parallels between the two, uh, but uh, I don't think that most people that actually experience the Slashdot effect would regard it as a denial of service attack, uh, although, uh, if you are a systems administrator trying to maintain a system, uh, sometimes you might find the two somewhat indistinguishable. Mm. Now, Rafi, uh, Twitter took on a, a different role um, within the context of, of geek protest uh, when we started talking about Twitter revolutions around the Arab sure. Spring. Um, I got the impression some critics of that whole idea missed Twitter's real role, um, which was it's a very fast organizational tool. Yeah, 100%. Like, Twitter doesn't really have an, a stance per se in all these type of events. We're kind of just the communications medium. We're just trying to prov provide a way for anyone to really talk across the world as loudly as you want. Our job is more to amplify some of the voice rather than figure out exactly which event we want to talk about the most. We're not trying to direct traffic. We're not trying to do anything else. We just want to really get people's voices out. It seemed to also take on that organizational function around the Occupy press, uh, protest, particularly in the U.S. Or, I think more specifically, the organizers used it as a coordination function to, to, to do their protest or to announce what is going to happen next. Like, uh, it sort of happened in San Francisco a lot, where you'd hear about protests coming on because people start retweeting a lot, and then masses would start organizing more and more. But again, Twitter's job is just more to provide like, the button and the box that you sort of distribute information on, and everyone just uses it as this loud medium. Uh, no, I have to ask you here, there, there were a great many people on the internet who thought that Twitter was censoring uh, the Occupy hashtags uh, from um, the, the trending topics, the sure. list of trending topics. Did you? No, we don't censor. Like, uh, the censoring on trending topics is just not something we do. Like, the, the trending topic algorithm is actually really pretty simple. Like, it, it, it favors what we call novelty over popularity. So, like, in reality, if something's just new and it's awesome and we haven't seen it before, the system sort of amplifies that. And But we start seeing a lot of information, so a lot of the same tag over and over again for days on end, the system, frankly, just gets bored of it a bit. And anything that's new will start popping up on top of that. We sort of do it the same way with, like, deal with Justin Bieber. For a long time, Justin Bieber would be trending all the time. But then after a while, it just becomes background noise. As long as someone else knew, that's a sort of spike up in there. Rob, do you feel any sense of, of parentage of, of the current culture of, of geek politics and geek protest? I'd because like, it, it I'd like to take all the credit. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely ancestry, right? But you have to kind of back up, right? Slashdot grows out of BBSs, out of Usenet, out of stuff from the 80s, you know? So this isn't new. This isn't, you know, we're just one step in the chain, I guess. So, you know, I, I can take credit, I guess, for being a tiny little piece of the ancestry, but parentage goes a little further back. Do, does it trouble you at all that, that the, the prime tool of, of Anonymous, which is the best known geek protest group, could be seen as vandalism, bringing down websites, including, you know, public service websites? Sure. Well, Anonymous is a, is a tricky thing to begin with. Uh, and I think that a lot of people don't understand that Anonymous is actually doing a lot more things than a lot of people realize. They actually are doing things against like child pornographers and stuff. They're doing things that the mainstream media isn't noticing. Uh, they are also doing things, you know, uh, you know, maybe things connected to like WikiLeaks, uh, you know, which which does get mainstream uh, media attention. Uh, I mean, it, it's all interesting stuff. It, it's it's. I, I, sometimes it's absolutely vandalism. Uh, other times it's actually significant and meaningful, uh, and it's just the nature of it being kind of a you know a kind of a headless organism. You know, it's going to do different things, uh, and some of them are going to matter a lot more than others, and some of them maybe just be silly. How would you characterize the politics that they're assembling around? Because I mean, you've had the politics section on slash dots and, you know, for a long time, or when you were there. Uh, I don't I don't know that I can characterize it uh, with slash dot. Uh, I always regarded Slashdot as being basically every extremist viewpoint all swirled together in a maelstrom of chaos. Uh, I, I would get emails from people who would claim that Slashdot was ridiculously conservative, and then this, the next day I get an email from somebody saying, how dare you oppress the conservatives? It's, you're, you're the mouthpiece of the Democratic Party. I, I, I mean, you can't really win. Uh, I, I think that I think Anonymous has a different agenda, but it's you can't really nail it down. They're anonymous, you know. They don't have a spokesman and a press release. You know, they they just they share what they they do what they do, and they, I guess they leave it to the media to try to spell out the meaning. Mm, Ruffy, um, Twitter did have a public stance on uh, the PIPA and SOPA sure. bills, which around which were mobilised quite a remarkable protest. Did you do anything besides, as a company, having a viewpoint on that? 
I mean, all we did really was just have our executives our sort of our, and our founders, the biggest names behind the business, so Ev, Biz, and Dick, sort of tweet very loudly on what our opinions are as a company, that we don't believe in this type of legislation. This is not right for the internet as a whole. But really, we didn't want to actually disrupt the service. And it really goes back to that, that point I was making before, sort of like remaining neutral, is that we want to provide a way for people to still complain and talk about these type of things on a global scale. And we, if we took sort of the Wikipedia approach, we would be black out content on what is a, a U.S. issue by preventing U.S. citizens from talking about talking about it very publicly. And we didn't want to go there. Instead, we just let our executives talk really loudly about it and just look at a number of retweets or a number of favorites they got on their tweets. Like, their message clearly got out. Hmm. And not I just talk about the performance groups. Executives got to be trending. It's all, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, we'll take a break now and return soon to look at the unlikely things the help, internet helps us make together.